uh, this event is made possible by the new art and culture fee uh, that makes uh, visiting scholars and artists uh, welcome here on campus at NIU. And we're delighted that uh, Dr. Winner is our inaugural um, present presenter. So it is my honor to introduce Dr. Winner. She's a professor of psychology at Boston College and senior research associate at Project Zero, Harvard Graduate School of Education. She directs the Arts and Mind Lab, which focuses on cognition in the arts in typical and gifted children as well as adults. She's written over 200 articles and is author of four books and co-author of three. And uh, we'll post some of these, this information um, in the chat to let you know. She has served as president of APA's Division 10, and I can let her explain what that is, Psychology in the Arts in 1995-96 and received the Rudolf Arnheim Award for Outstanding Research by a Senior Scholar in Psychology and the Arts from Division 10 in 2000. She's a fellow of APA Division 10 and of the International Association of Empirical Aesthetics. I like that. I want to be a part of that association. My um, interactions with Dr. Winner uh, are really um, by proxy. I picked up her book called How Art Works, which will be the topic of, uh, partly the topic of her conversation today. And I used, uh, of our electoral oh goodness. Oh, and I used it um, in, um, could we uh, make sure we're muting ourselves, my friends? Thank you. Um, I used it in my honors seminar last uh, semester on the evolution of the art. I think someone might have their phone on. It's okay. Um, and uh, in, uh, in your, it's a richly rewarding book and I encourage you all to uh, track it down and read it. Um, but she talks towards the end and I'm, this is no spoiler and I won't, I won't get into it too much, but she talks about habits of mind and, the, and what are the artist's disposition in those habits. And I found that very, very inspiring. And I believe there are, are great ways for us to think about the work that we do both as educators and as artists. So without any further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ellen Winner. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me. Um, let me just share my slides. There, can you see my slides now? Yes, okay, good. Um, and by the way, Division 10 is just the division of the arts in the American Psychological Association. Not the major subdivision, because the arts never are the major subdivision, but it's growing stronger and stronger by the year. So um, this is the cover of my book. It's supposed to be a puzzle, um, because I think there's a lot of puzzles about how art works. Um, and I wanted to... <clears throat> Give you some information about my background first. I um, started out in college majoring in literature, but before that I'd always wanted to be an artist. And I told my parents I wanted to go to art school, and they said, well, first you go to regular school and get a BA, and then you can consider art school. And being a compliant daughter, that is what I did. Um, and then I, after college, I went to the museum school in Boston and studied painting. And I did have it in mind that I would be an artist, but after a year I rethought it because it struck me as an exceedingly difficult career and I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to do it. And so I went back into academics and I became a research psychologist, developmental psychologist, and all my research has been about the arts, which makes me on the margins in psychology because most people in psychology study things like memory and attention and language. And when I tell people I study the psychology of the arts, they look at me, including psychologists, and say, well, what's that? So um, I came to Boston College after graduate school and joined the psychology department. And there I formed a lab called the Arts and Mind Lab. And you can see the logo down at the bottom. And there with my undergraduates and my graduate students and my research assistants, we did a lot of work on really how art works, um, how people conceptualize art, what art does to us, um, and also on arts education. Um, and Paul mentioned habits of mind, which is, grows out of our arts education work, and I'm not gonna be talking about that today, but I'm happy to answer any questions if people wanna ask me about that later. So I wanna start by just giving you a little bit of background about the field of psychology of art. 
I understand that I'm talking to students who are studying to become artists and studying to become art educators, as well as scholars in those fields. Maybe there are people in other fields, I don't know, but I don't know if there's any psychologists of art. So I'll just assume, that, assume not, and I'll say that um, for centuries, aesthetics was a branch of philosophy. And you have Kant there, and he asked big questions about art. What is art? What is beauty? What is an aesthetic response? And he answered those not by collecting data, not by doing surveys, not by doing experiments, of course, because he was a philosopher. Um, but in the mid 19th century, experimental psychologists began an empirical endeavor that they named Aesthetics from Below. And here is Gustav Theodor Fechner, um, and he really founded um, empirical aesthetics. And unlike philosophers like Kant, who speculated and reasoned about the nature of art, um, Fechner wanted to find out, wanted to collect empirical data to find out not what is art and what is beautiful, but what do ordinary people think is art? What do ordinary people think is beautiful? And his method was very um, simple. He simply took pairs of stimuli that differed in only one dimension and asked people which they preferred. Which do you find more pleasing? And this is just an example of his research into the golden section ratio of rectangles. You'd see all these different rectangles. You could see them in pairs. You could also see them laid out in a group and you'd have to pick which ones were the most, which one was the most pleasing. Um, either way worked. And what you see here is the ratio of five to eight chosen as the most pleasing. And so he said, look, I have evidence about what people think is most beautiful. They like this particular ratio, which we call the golden ratio. He did lots of other work along with his colleagues showing that um, people prefer curved to straight lines. They prefer bright to dull colors. They prefer the green blue area on the color spectrum more than other colors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you could say that these were very robust findings. They held up, they could be replicated, but they were very narrow. It was all about pleasure and sensation and it had nothing to do with meaning. And you could also say it was very atomistic. He wasn't looking at real works of art. He was looking at components like rectangles or color swatches. And so it's just not at all clear that these findings are applicable to actual, real, complex, messy works of art. So the field of the psychology of art was really reinvigorated by the cognitive revolution that happened in the middle of the 20th century. Um, the most interesting psychological studies of the arts today don't ask about what things people prefer um, they don't ask about one, one stripped-down perceptual stimulus over another. They're rather inspired by philosophical questions about the arts, such as these. What is art? Why do we seek out the sad, the horrible, the frightening in works of art? How can we judge the quality of abstract art? Does art make us more empath empathetic or empathic? Either way goes. And what's wrong with a perfect forgery? Some others. How can pure form and pure sound without any representational content like music or abstract art express an elicit, an, an elicit emotion? If I say that Agatha Christie is greater than Shakespeare, am I wrong or are all opinions equally valid? Does art making make us more intelligent? Is genius born or made? Now, I'm just gonna talk about the ones in red, but psychologists have investigated all of these things, um, all of these kinds of questions empirically. And before I talk about how they've investigated them, I wanna say, I wanna ask you to think about why we should even care about these questions. And my answer to that is that, first of all, these are things that people wonder about all the time. And so, Confronting these questions makes us think hard about things that we already kind of worry about. And also it makes us think about what kind of evidence would count in order to get an answer. 
So I want to start with the puzzle of what is art. The esthetician Clive Bell said that everyone in his heart believes there is a real distinction between works of art and all other objects. And you can ask yourself whether you agree with that. But philosophers have failed to define art. There have been so many attempts. Some people have argued, well, art is what is beautiful. But of course, we can come up with examples of art that is not beautiful. Art that must convey emotion, but we can come up with blank white canvases that are works of art sitting in the Museum of Modern Art in New York that are not very emotional. Must it be moving? Well, some art is moving, but not all is. Creative, must it be creative? Well, just because it's art doesn't make it creative. The, the first impressionists were likely much more creative than the ones who were the derivative impressionists. Must it be imaginative? Well, what does that really mean? And if I paint something that looks exactly like what I'm looking at, am I using my imagination? So not, these are just a few examples of, of components that people have argued for as part of a definition of art, but not all art has these. And things that are not art have these too. And that leads us to the conclusion that there are no necessary and sufficient features that make something a work of art. And this is consistent with modern philosophy. This is Morris Weitz, who was a philosopher at Brandeis, and he argued that art absolutely cannot be defined and we shouldn't keep trying to define it because the real reason is, is because artists keep challenging our concept of art. They keep forcing us to redefine it. He argued that art was an open concept. And that's because new cases are always going to arise that are going to force us to expand our concept of art. And we just don't know what these new concepts and what these new cases will be. And it is just logically impossible to lay down a set of defining properties that make something art. So look at the example on the left. This was an exhibit in an art museum in Italy. Um, and it was called Where Shall We Go Dancing Tonight? And all this um, all these bottles of champagne and confetti and all kinds of other things were littered all over the ground. And at the end of the day, when the museum was closing, the people who were cleaning up the museum just swept this all up and threw it away because they took it as trash. And obviously they didn't recognize that it was art. For them, it was trash. So the same things can be trash or can be art. It depends on how you think about it. And Usually when people say that's not art, they really mean that's art that I don't like, or that shouldn't be art, even though it is art because it's bad. Um, and most often people say this about abstract art or about conceptual art, but I have up here, don't forget the hatred of the Impressionists when they first painted. And here's a painting by Pissarro. And one of the critics published uh, something on this, painting saying wallpaper in its embryonic state is more finished. So the Impressionists were despised at first. So what people think they don't like, they like to say is not art. I've been impressed by the approach that the philosopher Nelson Goodman um, has given us for thinking about what is art. Nelson Goodman happened to be the founder of Project Zero where I've been affiliated all my research life um, and he had a profound influence on my thinking and in his book Languages of Art he asks us to think about the question of when is art rather than what is art and his famous example is a zigzag line and he asks he says imagine this is a line uh, on a graph of the stock market or an electrocardiograph um, all that's important for you to, to pay attention to are the ups and the downs um, you don't have to pay attention to the texture, the color, the variations in thickness. And this could be translated into a series of numbers and give you the exact same information. But if I tell you this is the outline of a mountain in a Chinese pen and ink landscape, all of a sudden other things are important to pay attention to. Those things I just mentioned, the textures, the changes in width, the color. And you could not translate this 
into a series of numbers and get the same information. It would be a completely different thing. Goodman called this repleteness, when all of the characteristics of a symbol become replete, become full, become part of the work's meaning. In the stock market, you don't have that fullness. It's just the, um, the ups and downs of the line and nothing else. Um, he also talked about metaphorical expression. If you think about this line in the work of art, you can talk about it being fierce, jagged, whatever. And if it doesn't make any sense to talk about these metaphorical feelings when you're thinking about this as a line in a stock market graph. So his argument is it's not like anything is or is not art. It's just that when we pay attention to something in a certain way, it is functioning as art for us. So I've told you a little bit about how philosophers think, um, but psychologists have said, well, if philosophers can't define art, Let's ask a simpler empirical question. What do people think is art? And I'll just um, tell you briefly about a study that was done by a philosopher that became an experimental philosopher, which really just means a psychologist. Um, and his, name, his last name is Camber. And he asked a, uh, a group of what he called art professionals, which I think were art historians. Um, is this or is this not art? So here was his first question, a small cloud in a blue sky. These were not presented as images, they were presented as words. And you can just think to yourself, would you or would you not say that this is art? 10% of people said, yes, that's art. That could be art. A painting by an elephant in the zoo, 36% said yes. A railroad bridge, 46% said yes. And here's my favorite one, a small dead tree on a hillside, 8% said yes. The reason I like that last example is because it made me think of this thought experiment and um, other people have thought of this too. What percent of biologists would say that a metal Christmas tree is a plant? I wager that zero would. But 8% of art professionals think that a dead tree is a work of art. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that the concept art has much more fluid boundaries than the concept plant, and plant is a natural kind. And the reason that art has such fluid boundaries is because artists are always messing with our concept of art on purpose. That's certainly what conceptual artists were doing. Okay, so that's what I want to say about the question of what is art and how psychologists have approached that question since philosophers have not been able to, except for the philosopher Nelson Goodman, who said, don't ask what, ask when, and the philosopher Morris Weitz, who said, just accept it, it's an open concept, ever expanding, and you'll never come up with a set of necessary and sufficient features. So I want to turn to puzzle number two, and that is, why is it that we seek out art that elicits negative emotion that we're very happy to avoid in real life? And here are two examples. This is uh, Goya's painting, 3rd of May, showing an execution. And then we have Caravaggio's painting of Judith beheading Holofernes. These are horrible, horrible to look at. And yet we also go to museums to look at them. So the question is why? Are we masochists? Are we sadists? Um, think about another question. How many of you um, enjoy tragic fiction or sad movies or visual art like this, but you really aren't enjoying the news today, or at least a week ago. Um, that's art versus real life. We seek these things out in art and we try to avoid things in real life that upset us. We certainly wouldn't want to go look at a real execution or somebody being beheaded. We would run as fast as we could away from it. So the question is, is there something about art that allows us to seek out emotions that we avoid in real life. And I think there are four concepts that have been put forward um, by psychologists to help us understand this. And the person who's done the most work on this is Winfried Menninghaus in Germany, um, who um, just stepped down as the director of the Max Planck Institute on Empirical Aesthetics. And he asks us to consider these four things. Aesthetic distance, which philosophers have certainly talked a lot about. Understanding, a mixture of positive and negative emotions, and the concept of feeling moved. 
So I'll talk a bit about each of these. So aesthetic distance is what allows us in because when you're looking at that Goya painting, you have distance from it because you know it's a representation. You know it's not happening right there in real life. It's not ha and it's not happening to you. And because of that distance, it allows you to embrace the negative emotions. He talks about distancing and then embracing. And here's a quote that I think captures it uh, pretty clearly. This comes from a participant in a study of why people like sad music who said, I can enjoy the pure feeling of sadness in a balanced fashion, neither too violent nor as intense as in real life. It's not as intense because there's aesthetic distance. And so aesthetic distance allows us to savor and to understand. And here's a quote from another participant in that study, uh, music saying, by contemplating this feeling in the music, I can get a better understanding of my own feelings without negative life consequences. And that's key, without negative life consequences. That's the aesthetic distance. And Aristotle talked about this too. It's not like Menninghaus was the first one to do this. He draws on philosophy. Aristotle said, we enjoy contemplating the most precise images of things whose actual sight is painful to us, such as the forms of the vilest animals and of corpses. The explanation of this is that understanding gives great pleasure. Here's a study that was done um, by Menninghaus and his colleagues, uh, where they showed people photographs like this, which are a little bit on the gross side. And this is one of the less gross ones. And People were randomly divided into two groups, the art group and the hygiene group. And the art group was told these are photographs from a contemporary art show, contemporary photography show. And the hygiene group was told these are images from a hygiene course to teach students about hygiene. And they were asked to look at them and they were asked, remember they only saw one kind or the other. They were asked to rate how positive they felt and how negative they felt. And what they found is that there was no difference in how negative they felt. The negative emotions that were elicited in both the art frame and the hygiene frame were, this, were identical in, in level. But in the art frame, people also felt more positive emotions than, along with the negative emotions. And they felt more positive in the art frame than in the hygiene frame. And Kant talked about, um, there being an inter, when you have an interplay of opposite feelings, it sets the mind of the spectator in motion. So there may be something about feeling this um, conjunction of positive and negative emotions at the same time that arrests, that arrests your attention. And this is a study that was done on why we like sad movies. And this gets us to another one of those components that I listed just a bit above, um, and that is being moved. Um, he showed that we really like sad movies. We go to sad movies to feel sad. We enjoy that feeling, but it is completely mediated by the feeling of being moved. So in this graph here, or this little graphic, you see that sadness is related to being moved statistically significantly, and all that means is the sadder you were, the more you were moved. Those two things went together. And being moved was statistically related to want to see it again, thinking this was worth seeing. So being moved was something that people liked because they wanted to see it again. But people who felt sad but did not feel moved didn't like the movie. And if you, they also were able to statistically take out the feeling, the, the moved scores to show that the link between sadness and liking the movie was only present if you kept in the, the feeling of moved. And if you took it out, the link went away. So another answer to why we like art that is, that is tragic, that makes us feel sad, is because of the pleasure of feeling moved. So now I wanna just say something about what feeling moved really is. Um, and again, I'm gonna talk about the research of Winfried Menninghaus towards a psychological construct of being moved. He asked people to recall, I mean, maybe you could just stop and think to yourself, what do you think feeling moved is? And think of an example of a time when you were moved. 
And then you can see whether what you're thinking fits the description I'm gonna give you that he comes up with about being moved. He asked people to recall instances of being moved and he found that people said they were moved by major life events like birth and death and marriage and farewell and reconciliation, as well as from art, various kinds of art, music, et cetera. And they also were asked how much control they felt over the situation that was causing them to be moved. And they rated this as very low. They didn't feel like they had much control over it. This was something that was coming at them. They were not controlling it. And very interestingly, he found that these experiences and these uh, were, were consistent with what he called pro-social ideals, things that you want to feel, like things you think are good things, like forgiveness and generosity and attachment. And so nobody said they felt moved by witnessing cruelty but you might feel moved by witnessing forgiveness. And finally, the emotions that people reported feeling when they felt moved were always a mixture of the positive and the negative, which gets us back to that hygiene study. When people were looking at art, they felt that mixture. So feeling moved is pleasurable. And that is one reason why people like to see art that is tragic or horrifying or uh, frightening. So aesthetic distance lets us enter into the work and it also allows us to savor the emotions we're feeling, the negative emotions, which leads to understanding. And art is of course all about understanding. And the art frame, when you know you're looking at a work of art rather than a hygiene photograph, um, it boosts the positive feelings even if it doesn't lessen the negative feelings. And tragedy in art, but not in life is moving. Tragedy in life is not particularly moving. It's upsetting and, and it doesn't have the positive that comes with it when you, where you, when you look at tragedy in art. And of course, part of the positive also comes from the beauty in the art form. So even if we can't define art, the concept of art must have some psychological reality because as soon as we think something is art, it changes our experience of that very same object. So now I wanna to get to my third puzzle. How can we judge the quality of abstract art? Now, this probably doesn't obtain to many of you in the audience since you are in the art world, but many people have a lot of problems with abstract art, including very highly educated people. And I'm sure you've all heard the, the phrase, my kid could have done that. And this uh, man looking at a side Twombly is supposedly thinking that. I just made that slide to illustrate that concept. Um, I don't know if anybody has ever heard of the um, artist and art educator, Robert Florjak. Um, I'm sure he's not high on the reading lists at NIU. Um, and here's, after I explain what he says, you will probably see why. He has a YouTube video called, Why is Modern Art So Bad? And he loves telling everybody that he gave this image to his studio art students and he said, please write me a paper about why this painting by Jackson Pollock is so great. And his students obliged by writing all kinds of wordy essays about um, what was so great about this painting. Of course, it doesn't really look like a Jackson Pollock, but we all know that. But And then he showed them this and he said, ha ha, this was a uh, close up of my studio apron. And Therefore, there is no difference between a Jackson Pollock and a random bunch of smudges. That was his point. And we've all been taken in. So now, um, I, a number of years ago, got very interested in the question of whether um, we could tell the difference between abstract art and not smudges on somebody's apron, but work by children. Because I was really, um, for a long time, very interested in the similarities between work by preschoolers and work by abstract expressionists. Um, I didn't, it wasn't that I saw no difference between them, but I thought there was something very special in the art of the young child that seemed to be lost when they got older. And I wanted to know whether, in fact, people could tell the difference between child art and great abstract expressionist art or not. And to, to make it a little more interesting, I also threw in animal art, art by elephants, chimps, monkeys, 
um, who, of course, these animals don't make art on their own in the wild, but they are sometimes given paints and brushes and uh, have paper put in front of them, and then it's taken away at the right moment, and then people make money off of these. So I'm just going to show you some of the images we used and see what you think. Uh, because either people can't discriminate, and it's true that anybody could have done this, including my kid, or people can discriminate, showing that people see more than they think they see. So you could just take a look at this pair of images. I had a wonderful doctoral student named Angelina Holly Dolan, and she was an artist as well as a psychology doctoral student, and she chose these pairs. Um, one of them is by an artist, and one of them is either by a child or an animal. And we've done this study many ways, but in our first study, we simply said, which one is the better work of art? And I'll tell you the answer. This is Elaine de Kooning, and this is by an elephant. Same question, which is the better work of art? I'll let you stare at it for a second. Hans Hoffman and a preschooler. Preschooler, Sam Francis. Orangutan, Helen Frankenthaler. So, um, I'm going to now tell you what we found from that first study. And here's a graph, and you can see on the bottom correct labels, no labels, and reverse labels. And that's because when we presented these pairs to people, the first 10 had no labels at all. And we didn't even tell people that some of these are by artists and some of these are by children and animals. We just showed them the images. And then the next 20 pairs, because there were 30 pairs in all, had labels. But half of them were correct and half of them were reversed. So that the Helen Frankenthaler said orangutan and the orangutan said Helen Frankenthaler, said artist. We didn't give the names, we just said artist, animal. Um, and these labeled ones were random, randomly distributed. So you might get a correctly labeled pair and then an incorrectly labeled pair. And here's what we found. So this is totally obvious. If you give people the labels and say one is an artist and one is an animal or a child, people are gonna say by and large that the one by the artist is better. It wasn't 100%, but you can see it's pretty high and it's way above chance, which would be at 50. These are the no labels, no labels at all, 65.5% correct. And this <clears throat> is significantly above chance. The, the real test came with the reverse labels. Would people just go by the label or would they ignore the label and go by what they saw? And you could think to yourself what you would predict. And here's what we found, which is they still were above chance in picking the artist, even though the artist was labeled as either child or animal. And all of these were significantly above chance. And these were psychology majors who said they didn't know anything about abstract expressionism. We did the same thing with art history majors and art majors and this very similar results. That's chance. So yes, it's not perfect, but it's significantly above chance. And that's what those asterisks mean. And we, did, we replicated this in a number of ways. Sometimes we showed them the pairs and simply said, which one is by the artist rather than the child or the animal. Sometimes we gave them the images one by one was because we thought maybe presenting them in pairs made it too easy because you could see the difference. We gave this test to preschoolers. They could do it too. We asked, we gave a, uh, we put people in front of a, um, I gave eye scanner machine and looked at how long they looked at the images when they were trying to decide. They looked longer at the artist one. And um, we even collaborated with a, an AI researcher who has a, had a deep learning machine that could learn to, if you show that machine works by a particular artist, it could then spit out art in that style. And he called me up and asked, said, could you give me your images? I'd like to train my deep learning machine on this and see if he, he or she can tell the difference. And Yes, indeed, the computer program was able to discriminate the works by the artists and the works by the non-artists. And then we wanted to find out what's going on. By the way, everything, every time we did this, we got a, a, something like 
65%, which was always significantly above chance. It was never 100%. It was kind of like the 65% rule. And then we wanted to find out how people were doing this, and we found out it was on the basis of perceived intentionality. Um, we asked people to rate the images on a whole bunch of dimensions, including how intentional does this look? And that was the one rating that significantly differentiated the works by the artists and the works by the non-artists, is they looked more intentional. And there had to be something actually physical, visible in the image, otherwise the computer program would not have been able to um, distinguish them, though it's very hard to, um, to define exactly what makes something look intentional. And in addition, we found that the, um, we were able to, to look at which images people were, had difficulty with and made mistakes on. And we found out that the computer made mistakes on the same ones that humans made mistakes on. So if there was a, an image by a child that looked highly intentional and an image by, say, Cy Twombly that looked very random, people might like, make mistakes. So they would also rate the, ch the child's painting as more intentional. And the computer did the exact same thing. So, um, because the, the AI researcher trained the computer on high intentionality images and low intentionality images, and then gave the, the computer new images to rate, and the computer could do it. And the computer human intentionality ratings correlated significantly. And here's a little more, uh, one more bit of evidence for the role of perceived intentionality in deciding whether something is um, good or is art. Um, this was a study. Um, done in 2014 and people were shown this out of focus picture and they were told either the photographer forgot to focus his camera or the photographer deliberately defocused the camera to make the colors more vibrant and in each case they were asked you could how much on a scale of one to seven do you consider this a work of art it wasn't a yes no thing and when it was intentional it was more likely to be rated it was more, it had a higher artness score. So in answer to, could your kid have done that? The answer is absolutely not. And untutored observers, these psychology students at Boston College knew nothing about abstract expressionism and they see more in abstract expressionism than they thought they see. And therefore, when you hear somebody at a museum saying that, you could say you actually can see more than you think you see. And we read intentionality, and this is what drives our classification. Okay, we're getting up to puzzle number four, and that has to do with forgery. If you have a perfect forgery of something, should you care? And if so, why? So this is um, something you can order on Amazon. It's an artificial tree, and the instructions say you'll just take the outdoor artificial tree pieces out of the packaging, and follow the simple instructions. In a few minutes, you'll have a perfect replica of nature's splendor. So you can think to yourself about whether you would like to have this in your backyard, although you might like to have it just as a conversation piece. I understand that. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about a famous forgery. Some of you may know this story. This is a painting called Christ and the Disciples at Emmaus. And in 1937, in Holland, Bradius, who was the Vermeer specialist, said, we have here the masterpiece of Johannes Vermeer of Delft, and it was signed by Vermeer. Now this painting was outed as a forgery that was actually done by Han van Meegeren, and he was a forger, in the Netherlands. He had tried to be successful as a painter and he had failed, so he decided to start forging. And he sold this painting to Goering during World War II. And after the war, when this painting was discovered in Goering's possession, it was traced back to von Meegeren, who had sold it to him, and he was arrested for war crimes for having aided and abetted an enemy by giving an enemy a national treasure. And he said, Actually, it's not by Vermeer at all. I painted it, and of course, nobody believed him. So in the courtroom, he created a new Vermeer, and there on the left is a photograph of him showing that he could create a Vermeer. 
the thing is, every, as soon as people knew it was a forgery, they stopped thinking that it was so great. And critics started saying things like it's sentimental, it's mediocre. And they even said that the face, whoops, the face behind Christ, uh, the woman looked suspiciously like Greta Garbo, who clearly was not around for Vermeer to have painted. So the same painting, once you think of it as a forgery, is disparaged. And there have been a lot of studies showing that if you tell people things are forgeries, or if you tell them another group the same image is, a, is an original, um, or if you don't even tell them it's an original, you just show one group a bunch of paintings and sculptures and another group the same ones, but you say it's a, it's a forgery or even just it's a copy. The ones that are framed as copies or forgeries are actually seen as physically smaller, less good, less beautiful, less awe-inspiring, less interesting, more boring. And they also activate brain areas that are different when, it's, when you think it's a copy. Um, they actually activate brain areas that are related to monetary reward because you know that a fake is not worth anything. So the question is why? Why does the same object get disparaged when we are told it's a, a forgery? And you can't say um, it's because you can tell it's less good because it's the same object, just like that, then the, that Vermeer, that fake Vermeer, the same images experienced differently. So you might say, well, it's just because forgeries are worthless and amoral or immoral, and that kind of negative feeling about it being immoral just rubs off on on your perception, or maybe the, the negative feeling of it not being worth any money is what rubs off. And those are kind of obvious answers. And so we wondered in my lab whether there could be something more. And so we said, well, could we get rid of the immorality and the lack of monetary value in a forgery and do this and, and look at what, how people react? So we asked ourselves, what is like a forgery, but doesn't include loss of money and isn't immoral? And we came up with the idea that a perfect copy by the artist's assistant who was asked by the artist to make a copy and um, which would be worth the same as the original because it was signed by the artist. That might be something to look at. And you know, many artists do have their assistants make copies or help them in their work. They don't put their hands on everything they make. And this was, is true in the, in the Renaissance um, as it is true today with contemporary art. So would we care if we were looking at something that first we thought was by the artist and then we thought was by the artist's assistant, the artist had asked him to do it and it is identical and it was signed by the artist. It is not immoral because it was, it's his common practice and the artist asked him to do it and it's worth the same amount of money. So we did a little experiment on this. We showed people two images and we told them that one on the left is by the artist and the one on the right, well, depending on which group you were in was either also by the artist or by the artist's assistant or by a forger. And these are identical because we simply copied and paste, pasted. And we said this one on the left is the first in a series of 10 images painted by April Gornick. Um, the one on the right is the second in a series of 10 images painted by either artist, assistant or forger. And then we asked people, oh, we also showed them that, um, we showed them the estimated price at auction and for all of them, except for the forgery, the two prices were the same. And you can see $53,000 here. But for the forgery group, they were told estimated price at auction, $200. And we just asked them to rate which one is more X. And each person only had to make one rating. So we had lots of different people making these ratings. Which one is more creative? Which do you like more? Which is more original? Which is more beautiful? Which one is the better work of art? And which one is more likely to be influential? And we divided these ratings up into what we call the aesthetic evaluative ratings and the historical evaluative ratings. The aesthetic evaluatives were like, beautiful, and better, and the historical ones were ones which placed the work in the context of time, more original, influential, more creative. So here's what we found for the like, beautiful, and better ratings for the aesthetic evaluative ratings. The copy by the assistant was rated as equal to the copy by the artist, okay? Um, the copy by the forger was worse than both. So there was no difference 
in the copy by the assistant and the copy by the artist. Because we had taken away immorality and we had taken away monetary, loss of monetary value. But when we looked at the historical evaluative dimensions, original, influential, and creative, then even though they were identical, they had the same signature and they were worth the same amount, and even though the copy by the assistant was sanctioned by the artist, the copy by the artist was rated higher than these. The forgery was always the worst, but we weren't that interested in forgery because you can always explain forgery away by immorality and loss of money. We were interested in what happens when it's a perfect copy by the artist who's not, by the artist's assistant. And we found that on these originality, influential and creative dimensions, there's still bias towards the one by the artist. And it's puzzling actually, because they're both conceived by the artist. They are both copies. Neither of them are originals because they're both the second. They're both worth the same. They both have the same prestige and have the artist's stamp on it. So my explanation for this has to do with the concept of essentialism. That there must be a kind of belief that artists imbue their creations with some special quality <laughs> at the moment when, you make, when the work is made. When you're looking at a work that you believe is by Vermeer, you feel like you're coming into contact with Vermeer and his mind. I read a comment um, in the New York Times a few years ago at somebody with somebody was looking at an original that turned out to be a forgery. And he said, when I was looking at the original, I felt like I was shaking hands with the artist. You know, and when we buy a Picasso, if we were ever so lucky, we're buying a piece of Picasso's essence. And this brings us back to what um, Walter Benjamin, the 20th century German philosopher said, when he wrote about um, the aura of the original in the time of mechanical reproduction, that the original always has something that a re perfect reproduction doesn't have. It has the aura of the original. It has the aura of the time and the place when it was made. And you know, it's not just works of art have this, that have this. If you lose your wedding ring, you can get it replaced and it can be identical, but it's not gonna feel the same to you because it's symbolically different. And the same for a child's teddy bear. If a child loses his favorite teddy bear, just try replacing it. You're not gonna be very successful, even if it looks just like it, unless you fool the child. But if the child knows it's a replacement, there's gonna be a problem because it doesn't have that essence. And you have essentialism in nature too. That's what's wrong with this, with this tree. So I think that when we judge a work of art, we cannot separate the process from the product. Because if we, knowing, if we have to know how it was made and who made it, because that shapes how we experience it. So a little mnemonic is looking good is not enough. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Hockney controversy, with David Hockney, the British painter, um, wrote a book uh, in which he argued that the great Renaissance masters of, of, in the Northern Renaissance used lenses to project the images of what they were trying to paint. They projected them onto a white wall or white canvas and then traced it. And that's how they were able to make very, very realistic images. Suddenly, realism grew in the Northern Renaissance. Um, and he explains it by these tricks. And art historians got extremely upset by this because they, say, they said, you, you, you're saying these people weren't geniuses, that they just used a tool. And they didn't want that because they wanted to think about how it was made in a different way from Hockney, how Hockney was presenting how it was made. And I think this inability to separate who made it from the product also raises the art morality question, which I've really been wanting to research, but haven't been able to come up with a design that doesn't kind of give it away. And that is that if you look at a work of art and you find out it was made by somebody that was really horrendously amoral, like belong to the, the SS, belong to a white supremacy group. Could you experience, could you separate the experience of the work of art from what you know about the maker? And my hypothesis is that you really can't separate it because a work of art is a product of the mind of the artist. And if the mind is contaminated, then you can't help but see the work is contaminated. But this is just my speculation. I haven't done that study. 
Um, and I think this perfect copy, perfect forgery issue gets us to the question of what about art created by machines? And you know that now machines can create visual art, literature, and music in the style of great artists. They just learn the style, they extract the style, and then they spit out more. New works by Dickens, perhaps, or works in the style of Dickens. Um, and works in the, you know, works that are being passed off as Dickens, newly discovered works. And here's um, an example from the, um, uh, in Netherlands Museum, um, Folkert, I know you're here. I don't, I'd love to know whether you visited this museum. Um, not, the muse not the Van Gogh Museum, but the museum that's not, um, uh, that's a little further away, that has 3D prints of Van Gogh paintings that are supposedly impossible to distinguish from the originals. But you know they're not made out of paint and canvas, and you know that Van Gogh didn't touch them. So the thought experiment I'd like to give you is, if you could go to either the Van Gogh Museum or the 3D Print Museum, they were equally available to you, which one would you go to and why should it matter? And I just saw this in the New York Times, high tech twin for a Renaissance masterpiece. A copy of Michelangelo's David printed in 3D will be the centerpiece of the Italy Pavilion at the 2021 World Fair. Now there it's probably because they couldn't transport the real David, so maybe it's worth it there. But if you had your choice of looking at one or the other, which would you look at? Maybe some of you wouldn't care, I don't know. I would. And here is a, um, one of these is a painting by Rembrandt and one of these is a painting by a machine who extracted Rembrandt's style. Maybe you can tell. You can congratulate yourself if you could tell, but if you saw it all by itself, the one on the left, in a bunch of Rembrandt paintings, among a bunch of Rembrandt paintings in a museum, you probably wouldn't stop and say, oh, there's something wrong with that. So before we go to the final puzzle, is this a good thing? to have uh, 3D prints and uh, AI printing out, uh, spitting out works by known artists that are in their style. Um, I personally do not think it's a good thing because I think it disrupts art history, literary history. Um, but um, some people, we did a little study on this and we found that people were 50-50. Some people said, I think it's fantastic because then there'll be more Rembrandts to look at or there'll be more novels by Dickens to read. So you can, Think about that puzzle. Last puzzle, art and empathy. Um, you know, when people are trying to justify the arts in schools, they often use the test score argument, which is bogus, that the arts are good for kids because it raises their test scores. And it's absolutely not true. Um, and I can talk to you about that if you want. Um, and there's no reason why it should raise their test scores. Um, but another comment that's often made is it makes us more empathic. Well, is this true? And it not, it's not just made about the visual arts. It's made about the arts and the humanities in general. Is this just a feel-good statement? Well, William James made a comment about this that I think is a, very amusing. He said, I like to think about the Russian lady sitting in the theater weeping over the events occurring on stage while her coachman is outside freezing in the snow. And this gets to the question of whether people feel very empathetic towards fictional things, like works of art, representations of things, and then they feel like they've paid their empathy dues and they don't actually have to be empathic about real people once you leave the theater or close the pages of the novel. It's certainly true that works of art enlarge and expand the kinds of people we come to know and understand because where else but in a Dickens novel or a Melville novel or in a, uh, uh, an etching by Daumier are we gonna see these kinds of people? There's, there's just such a wide variety of characters in art. Um, so it certainly may help us to understand them better, but does it actually make us more compassionate, more kinder, more empath empathetic? And there, the research on this has been pretty weak. Um, and so I don't think we really know the answer to this question yet, though I'm in the midst of doing a study with one of my thesis students where she is randomly assigned people to read a memoir, which is like a novel. It's, it's true, but it's still a story. It's a narrative about um, an undocumented immigrant versus reading 
facts about undocumented immigrants and she's looking at their attitudes towards undocumented immigrants before and after. And uh, we'll see what we find. It's very hard to change people's attitudes um, as you saw from the recent election. Very difficult, but um, we'll see whether the story form is more powerful than the factual form in making moving people, nudging them a little bit more in the compassion direction. So um, I want to give you some takeaways and then um, stop so we can have a discussion. Um, these are my five takeaways. Art cannot be defined in a way that captures all artworks, including those in the future, but an art frame changes our experience in a positive way. Number two, we seek out the sad and the horrifying in art just as we seek to avoid these in life, and we do so because of the pleasure of understanding and the pleasure of feeling moved. <clears throat> Three, even people untrained in art can distinguish paintings by abstract expressionists from superficially similar paintings by children and animals, and they do this on the basis of perceived intentionality. And so people see more in abstract art than they think they do, and people can judge skill in abstract art. Four, we judge art not only by how it looks, but by what we believe about how it was made and by whom it was made. Looking good is not enough. We want to feel the artist's essence. And finally, whether art of any kind in any art form makes us more empathic really remains to be determined. So now I'm going to stop and thank you for your attention. And I am happy to move into the discussion phase if anybody wants to ask me a question. Uh, hello. Uh, if I if we have a question, do we just speak up or? Yeah. Just, hold on. Can I ask Alan? Do you mind stop sharing your screen and then? Oh, yes. 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 I knew there was something I'd forgotten. Yes. All right. And I'm going to switch it so we can see everyone. Um, and if you have a question you would like to ask, you're welcome to put it in the chat. Or if you would like to, you know, raise your hand or you know speak up, that's fine. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry, I with somebody who had a question, I just heard, and I'm sorry, um, why don't you go ahead, the person who just started speaking. Hi, uh, my name is Keith uh, Millis. I'm in the psychology department. Ah. And um, so you start off with, you know, uh, defining art. Uh, what is the problem with defining art as art is that which, you know, a, 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 uh, an agent intentionally made, you know, it's by yeah. the, yeah. I, mean, yeah. I do think that's true, that art is something that an agent intentionally made. The only trouble is a lot of things that agents intentionally made are not art, right? Like this pen or. Um, no, 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 no. But if it's the intention that it is art, I mean, I, I could oh. say. Uh, this is art. This is my art exhibit. Yeah, well, yeah. actually, that's pretty much the way it, it's, it's pretty much the way things are going in the art world today, except it's not just you who get to say it's art. It's the mm -hmm. gatekeepers. It's the museums. It's the textbooks. It's the curators. So once one of them says this is art, it becomes art, whether you like it or not, because it is labeled art. And then you can decide right. whether you think it's good or not. Yeah, it seems to account for lots of your findings. I mean, the, the forager, I mean, their intention might be uh, for money or, you know, uh, to trick people yes. you know, versus creating art. But it seems like it's, that might go some distance. Yeah, no, that's true. The forger has a completely different intention. It's either to mm -hmm. make money or to spite the art world. Those are the, or mm -hmm. the art critics uh, who didn't appreciate them. So their intentions are different. And maybe I think what you're saying is if you know somebody's intentions, are not to make art, but to, to but to trick people, then maybe it's not art. Is that yep. what you're saying? Yeah. And I wasn't trying to say that a forgery isn't art, actually. I was just trying to say we don't think it's as good. Is a forgery a work of art? I mean, I think a forgery might be. I might come down on the side of saying, yeah, I wouldn't say a forgery is not art. I just wouldn't like it as much. Yeah, it seems to be a dance between the artist and the viewer. 
Right, in terms of how you respond to it. You're thinking about what was in the artist's mind and then that shapes how you respond to it. But I'm not sure that it would make me say it's not art. Hmm. Okay, thank you. It looks like we have a question from Brittany Kesselhorst. I'm sorry if I pronounced it. Kieselhorst, it's okay. It's German and awful. Um, yes, I have a question. Um, so I know you had talked earlier about how this wasn't about like arts education, but um, I am a pre-service music teacher and I was wondering if there are like things that you have found just like based off of the things you've seen with people like in the brain and how it relates to art and how that relates to like the necessity of arts education. You know, um, there have been some studies showing that if you put the word brain in an article or you put an image of a brain MRI in an article, people think, take it more seriously. Um, and people often like to say, um, this is really good education because it's brain-based. And, you know, I have a problem with that because all education is brain-based because everything you do affects the brain. And so people try to say, well, music is really good because it affects the brain. Well, it does affect the brain, but so does juggling. And there was a famous study done which taught people how to uh, juggle and they imaged the brains before and after three months of juggling practice and their spatial areas of their brain had grown. Um, but then after they stopped juggling, they went back down. So it becomes a, really a value question of what do you value if you value if juggling changes the brain, does that mean it should be a core subject in our schools? I think you can say the same thing about music. So I think we can't just say we need, we need music because it changes the brain. Um, we need music because we value music and we have to come up with reasons for why we value music and why we value the arts. I don't know if that helps. And, and, and I don't mean, and I do think it's interesting to look at the areas of the brain that are affected when you learn a musical instrument, when you respond to music. But honestly, I think that tells you more about the brain than it does about music. If there are any neuroscientists in the, in the, in the audience, they might not like that. But. Um, Brittany, if you haven't had a chance to read Ellen's book yet, there's some interesting facts in there about how much time people spend listening to music and how much it infiltrates their life. So I would recommend it. I saw that um, Carrie Friedman had a question in the chat. Was that something you wanted to pose to Ellen? That, that question seems to have gone out of my chat box. I, I think you said, do you know of studies comparing preferences of visual arts people versus lay people? Oh, I yeah. yeah, I was asking. I was asking specifically about the move concept that moved them, mm -hmm. um, because I, I when, when I I actually use Third of May in one of my classes, and I use it because I think it's an incredibly beautiful painting. It's extremely well constructed, and like many paintings that I prefer, he, the artist has made horror look beautiful, which is just a really interesting concept to me. And um, so I guess in that sense, I would say it moves me. And in, 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 that is in the sense that I think it's well constructed. And I wonder um, if you know about studies where that kind of comparison is made between arts folks and non-art folks. Well, I do know um, there were some studies um, done quite a while ago by Irvin Child at Yale. And he showed um, that art experts or people who knew a lot about art had different preferences from quote unquote lay people. And the, the lay preferences were considered more uh, saccharine, less good uh, by the art experts, of course. Um, so there were differences. Um, and also another finding, and this didn't come from him, but I think that's a general finding. I don't know any particular study, um, but I'm sure there is one showing that um, realism is a more important criterion for liking something if you're not trained in art. And yeah. also people who are not trained in art are much less likely to, to like abstract art, contemporary art. Yeah, that, those studies were done some decades ago, my dissertation was actually on preferences, art, uh, art experts versus lay experts. So I know the older- You know the answer to that question. Well, but, uh, but, I, but I haven't read any of that literature recently and I don't know 
anything about the literature on whether or not or how it moves you. I mean, that's a really interesting concept. Oh, I see. You're asking whether there's differences in what moves you. Yeah, in, 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 your, you know, in the psychological definition of move and how, it, how it's conceptualized as affecting people. Right. Yeah. So um, I think the, the research on being moved is a pretty new area. And the one study that I know about, which found um, a lot of individual differences, but not in terms of lay expert, was um, a study done showing that uh, people were shown a whole bunch of images and they had to rate from one to four how much they were moved by it. And then they were put into the brain, into an MRI machine. And the, um, as they looked at the image that they found most moving, um, a particular area of their brain which was activated, which I could talk about. But the most the point I'm trying to make here is that people didn't agree at all on what was moving. So this was considered a strength of the study because when you put people in the scanner and they were looking at the images that moved them, it wasn't all the red images or the jagged line images. It was different for each person. Um, but it doesn't get at your question of lay versus, I think that would be very interesting to look at. And I, I don't have an answer. And there may be a study out there that I don't know. But the same part of the brain, did, did you say, I'm sorry, you cut out just for a second. Oh. We're having a big storm out here. Um, it, but the same part of the brain was affected regardless of what they chose? Yes, and it was called the default. It is the, It was the default mode network, which is an area of the brain that is usually um, at rest, um, but is activated when you are thinking, when you are introspecting. And so the argument that was made was that when people are feeling very moved by works of art, it connects to them and they think about themselves. The only problem with that is that it wasn't, they didn't actually do a behavioral measure. So they didn't actually ask people what they were thinking about. So we don't mm -hmm. know for sure that they were introspecting, but that study was replicated and the scientists who worked on it were very good. That actually is my example of the best neuroscience of art study that I know of because it tells me something about art if that claim of introspection is true. It doesn't just tell me something about the brain. Thank you. Um, I see we've got a number of hands and a number in the chat, but I'm going to go with Christian. Um, Hello. Uh, I have a question related to how do psychologists address measuring the sort of ineffable or part of the, oh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I, I study experimental aesthetics at NIU uh, with Keith in the chat. Uh, but part of the issues that we have is we're interested in how people understand artwork. Um, and there's sort of the shortcomings in measuring understanding. Um, rating on a scale of like one to six is kind of difficult to measure someone's understanding. Can you, can you move the microphone a little away from your mouth? Because it's really hard for me to understand. Sorry about that. Uh, part of the difficulty measuring how much someone understands something is whether to use Likert type scales of one to six or having them list their thoughts, which might interrupt sort of the aesthetic experience. Yes. So I'm wondering, uh, what are your thoughts on that? It, I think if I understood, if I heard you correctly, you're asking about the difference between asking um, how much somebody understands something by asking them to just give their thoughts freely or to give them a, a set of thoughts and they have to rate how much they feel those thoughts on a, on a Likert scale. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a that's a problem that psychologists always face. Do you want a free response, or do you want to confine your set of responses so that you your scoring will be easier? Personally, I think a free response is much better because um, you're not you're not biasing people in any way. It's certainly good to do free responses in the beginning of a research program, and then you can maybe have a hypothesis. And then you can narrow it down and give them specific, specific answers, uh, specific categories to check off and use a Likert scale. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and ask this question from the chat, and then I'll call on one more person or more people. This is um, Jordan, who's a, a fine arts student, and they've asked, what did you mean when you said the AI replications of art would disrupt art history? Oh, well, because they're not always going to have a little label on them saying this came from a machine. They're going to get lost. And so people are, the labels are going to get lost. And so people are going to really think that this is by Rembrandt. 
or this is a new novel by Dickens that I hadn't come across before. And so if you really want to understand what Rembrandt's output was, you want to know what he made and not what some 20th first century machine made. Um, Folkert, I'm not sure if I'm saying your name correctly. I apologize. Yes, Folkert is okay. Yes, uh, I just, um, Ellen asked if I was uh, at the 3D uh, yeah. Museum. Well, I, I wasn't, no, but uh, very near the museum, you can buy uh, copies of Van Gogh made, by, made in China. And I don't know if you know, there is a very beautiful documentary, uh, China's Van Gogh's, where oh. it's about a village where there are, they're making thousands of copies uh, yearly of Van Gogh and, uh, and sell them. And uh, these people uh, never seen a real Van Gogh, but in the documentary, uh, three people are taken to Amsterdam and, and for the first time they have made thousands of copies already and then they first see the, the real Van Gogh and uh, and instead of a forgery scene smaller they think the, the, the Van Goghs are smaller than they, they imagine. <laughs> I love it. And also the, the colors are different than they but they are still very moved by really moved by seeing real Van Gogh so it's it's a uh, really worthwhile to look at that documentary. I will definitely look at that you know China is one of the major uh, sources of art forgeries there. Yeah, yeah there. but these are, are willingly copies. You know you buy a copy. But oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's also very nice to look. Of course, they have to learn to make this copy. So you see people, students trying to make uh, and, and who don't still uh, get a real good looking copy. And they are very nice to look at, I think. <laughs> So then the question I would have is, would you rather look at one of those or would you rather look at a perfect uh, a perfect reproduction or a perfect 3D print reproduction? Yeah. Well, I, I'd rather look at a failed copy of Van Gogh. They are beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, maybe there's something wonderful about thinking that somebody in China actually painted that. Uh, just like there might be something wonderful about thinking that this elephant painted this painting that you have mm -hmm. on your wall. Um, it's, it's intriguing. Yes, it is. But okay. it changes how you experience it. Yes. I think that Doug had a question. Hello, Ellen. Thank Hi. you. For, thank you for coming. I'm sorry I was late. That's okay. Uh, Glad to see you. Yeah. Good to see you too. And thank you for the presentation. Uh, one of the questions I had uh, was about uh, your discussions about the judgments that are being made by people about whether or not the quality of one piece was better than the animal did or whatever, you know, the, yeah. the question that I have really is who are the people who are making those judgments and does culture make a difference? And what this reminded me of was the replication of the U curve uh, theory study that David Pariser did. And then uh, Falker did, I think two or three of them. And then uh, Anna Kindler did one in, in Hong Kong. And what was found was that when you had different judges or different people making the judgment, you got a different outcome. Right. The U curve is definitely a product of modernism, of our modernist eyes. Yes, it is. Yeah. And so the, and so the follow-up, really the follow-up question is whether the conceptions of what art is and what makes, my, makes art valuable, is that a Western construction too? Yeah, I think that's a fascinating question. And, um, and I do not think this has been done cross-culturally. Um, the question you first started to ask about who's making the judgments in the study about which is better, the animal art or the child art or the abstract expressionist art, that was only done with Western people, probably weird people, you know, W-I-R-E-D. Um, or maybe I left out the E, W-I-E. <laughs> um, and, uh, but there, you see, they were just comparing two different abstract works. So it would be very different from the U curve where basically people did not like messy art. Messy art was, was bad and realistic art was better. And that's why, that's why you didn't find a U curve. That's why the works by young children weren't prized. Um, so I think it would be very interesting to look at a uh, cross-cultural study of uh, studies of people's conceptions of what art is and it may be that in more traditional societies certainly uh, that they would they would be 
less hesitant. I mean, people are always willing to try to define art. The question is whether any philosophers have ever succeeded in coming up with an airtight definition that has both necessary and sufficient features that allow you to distinguish what is art from what is not art. And um, people, ordinary people on the ground might differ. In more traditional societies, they may be more likely to think they could define art. It's, uh, it's modern art and contemporary art that throws us all off base. Yeah, it's, it's when the cultures clash that things come unstuck. I'm thinking of uh, a situation in Australia uh, w w that occurred with an artist called Clifford Possum, who was an Aboriginal artist who made a great deal of, uh, of art and it, it became very popular in the art markets in Australia. And uh, then it, what people didn't understand was that in the community in which he lived, everybody shared everything and people who were Clifford's cousins and relatives would come to him with the paintings that they had done and ask him to sign them and he did. And it wasn't until some time later that the art market discovered that Clifford Possum's paintings weren't painted by Clifford Possum and they were signed by him and, and it threw the whole, the whole community into a complete uproar because they didn't know what to do. The notion of fine art had been challenged. So that sounds very Western. <laughs> yes, it is. That's what happens when you put an Aboriginal artist into a Western context. It doesn't work. Yeah, he didn't know there was anything wrong with it. No, but he didn't. He was completely flummoxed by the whole fuss. That's that's fascinating. But the but the rest of the people. I mean, did the Aboriginals also mind when they when they they the Aboriginals were probably not buying Aboriginal art. Oh no, they were making it and selling it, and everybody was doing very well. That's, that's a wonderful story. I have a few questions from the chat. Uh, so this one is from Melissa and she says, um, all of our discussion so far has been about how art impacts the viewer. Is there a research discussion or research or discussion about how doing art impacts the artist psychologically? Well, First of all, you can look at what artists say. That's totally anecdotal, of course, but if you start with looking at what they say, artists talk about <clears throat> how they can't not make art, that it, it, they have to do it and it's their salvation and they would go crazy if they couldn't do it. And it also helps them um, really go away from the real world into their own world. Um, I do have a former student named Jennifer Drake, who's at, um, Brooklyn College, and she's done a whole series of studies looking at ordinary kids, not art, not art prodigies, just ordinary kids, as well as adults. And she asks a simple question. If you get people to feel really sad about something, and then you ask them to make a drawing, um, and you, uh, first of all, how does that affect their, feel, their emotions? But more interestingly, she wants to know whether they're most helped by working out on paper what they're upset about, the art therapy kind of route, um, which she calls the venting route or the expressing route, or if she gives them instructions to make art about something that's completely different from what they're upset about, that takes them away, the distraction route or the escape route. And what she finds over and over again is that, first of all, just making a simple drawing elevates people's mood, no matter what instructions you're giving, given. Um, she induces a sad mood in people first by asking them to think about something very, very sad that happened to them. And she measures their mood. It's all done by self-report. And um, But what she finds is that the most effective is not working it out on paper and expressing it on paper, but escaping. And you might think that's trivial or just, oh, it's just, they're just distracting themselves. But actually, if you look at things artists have said, they often talk about how it takes them away from the banality or the pain of life into another world. And that seems to have um, elevating effects on positive feelings, which I don't think would surprise any artists. I actually have a question for you that I'd like to ask. Okay. Um, so, you know, you talked about empathy and in your book, you t particularly talked about the effects of literature and acting on like compassionate empathy. And I saw that um, Carrie mentioned 
you know, some of the recent work with nurses and how looking at art increases empathy. And, um, but what I didn't see in your book was any research about looking about art or how visual imagery and analysis and discussion around visual imagery can help support or promote empathy or particularly compassionate empathy. And I think in particular, this has a lot of implications now when we're looking at art as a form of social justice and social activism. And so I'm just wondering if you know of any research or what your thoughts are on that area. So actually, um, I don't believe there is research on that. And I am actually starting to work with a student to develop a, a, a study on that. Um, if you look at paintings of suffering, does it make you feel the pain of the fictionalized represented person? And does it, if it's a suffering of a certain kind of person, does it actually increase, does it transfer to empathy for people who are like that outside of the art museum frame? Um, the study you were talking about, about the nurses, I, I know about this with doctors, and it's probably the same study where you, they get people to look at portraits and they get them to talk about all the things they see in the portraits. And then they measure um, their ability to diagnose a patient. And they claim that the more carefully they learn to look at portraits, the better they are at diagnosing. Um, I think that's, that makes a lot of sense. It's basically just training and looking closely. Um, and it wouldn't even have to be in an art museum with works of art. You could just look at it with photographs in a high school yearbook and I bet you get the same effect, but they do it with art, which is great because then it gives people more experience in, in art museums. But the issue of whether looking at, at paintings of suffering and talking about it, whether that transfers to making you more empathic, it feels like it should, but we don't know. Maybe somebody here knows of research on that. I don't. I've heard Paul. Um, there's an interesting phenomenon called mirror neurons, yes. and it's controversial. Uh, but there's a lot of work in empathy, and of course, this is more performative because the mirror neurons are related to motor neurons and uh, reflect. It's an interesting concept, and it's very controversial, I admit. But it seems there is some indication that as the performer moves, the audience is also too moved. Right. And there's an the, the implication in that is that um, that movement uh, leads towards greater sensitivity, understanding, right. empathy. Um, there's a, a kind of connectivity that occurs in this. So that's an interesting area of study. We were talking before the uh, presentation that we need a, a CAT scan or an MRI scan that is undetectable by the um, by the person who's being observed in order to really have a a sufficient you know scientific evidence about that because we're just lost to, in terms of language it's it's just never going to be sufficient well, I will first... say... hmm? go ahead no i'm done i will say that um another former student of mine talia goldstein who's at george mason university has done some research on um, acting and empathy and she did a longitudinal study um for her for her um dissertation of kids uh, and adolescents in a uh, nine-month acting program. Um, and she had a control group of kids in the visual art program. And she gave them uh, empathy tests. Of course, I have to say that the empathy tests psychologists use are self-report tests. So we don't have great empathy tests. But she did show that the acting trained kids increased in their empathy, both their understanding of other people and their feeling of other people's pain more, significantly more than the visual arts group. Um, now the visual arts group was just doing, um, they were basically doing observational drawings. So they certainly weren't learning to paint paintings of people suffering and talking about that. So um, there she did find, and <coughs> I don't think you need a brain scanner for that. Um, I don't even know if we know where to look. We know where to look in, for the theory of mind area of the brain, but I don't know where we would look for compassionate empathy. I'm not quite sure we know that. So. Um, I think there's something about embodying a character and you have to feel their emotions that might just train you better in feeling other people's um, emotions. And that might be even more powerful than um, reading uh, a story and putting yourself in the place of the story characters because you're not physically embodying them. Thank you. I do like Brian Boyd's um, 
book on the uh, on the origins of stories, which talks a lot about a, well, he talks somewhat about similar things about is the act of story reading and storytelling does that generate empathy, compassion, connection, those kind of things. Okay. Maybe, thank you. I'm just going to ask, are there any other oral questions from the audience, people who'd like to, to ask Ellen? Um, I have one quick question. Yes. Um, I remember uh, reading a book by Robert Solso, mm -hmm. and um, he talks about uh, what is engaging in art is to the extent that you can kind of put yourself I, let's say paintings, put yourself into the painting. If the scene depicts things can afford interaction with that mm -hmm. world. Um, but I haven't really found any research on that. And, and I was wondering uh, whether you know anything about that or comment. You mean actually imagine yourself in the physical space? Yeah, th that art that um, invites you uh, or it gives you affordances to, to, yeah, like to put yourself into that space, interact mm -hmm. with that character, pick up that object. Right. Uh, you know, because it's kind of based on uh, kind of evolutionary sort of perspectives yeah. of, you know, part of your brain really doesn't know that you're looking at a piece of art. Or I'm talking about representational art versus a painting. You might uh, forget that you're looking at a representation, you mean, and actually be drawn into it. Yes, um, yes, to some degree. Hmm. Well, it's an interesting concept. I don't think you ever forget that you're actually looking. No, 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 yeah, he's not saying you, you forget, but part of your brain is yeah. being, uh, right. kind of being seduced. Right, and that, the... would, that would explain uh, an attraction to, to highly realistic art, I guess. Um, but I also know that, um, People have claimed that when, when, when you look at a Rothko painting, if you move really close up, you feel like you're inside the painting. And I've tried that. I've gone into to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and stood an inch away until the guard comes um, from the Rothko <laughs> to feel this feeling of being enveloped. And, and, and I think you feel that there too. Um, so um, I'm not sure how you would actually um, measure the feeling of being enveloped or the feeling of being inside the picture, but it's an interesting thing to think about. Thank you. All right, well, at this point, it is 5.30. We've, um, I feel like we've had a really rich discussion here in the last half an hour. And I just want to thank Ellen and the college for sponsoring Ellen's visit here today. It's been exciting to see so many of our colleagues from around the university and from other universities join us. So um, I just want to say thank you, Ellen. I really enjoyed this, this talk. Thank you very much. And thank you, Doug, for inviting me. And uh, it's very nice to meet all of you. Yes, I, I, I had my thanks, uh, Ellen. I, I, uh, was wondering whether we would pull it off. We did, and you're here, and uh, it, it was great. Thank you so much. A very good discussion. I'm sure it will feed into uh, classroom discussions as, as the weeks go on. Great. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks for coming, Ellen. Thank Bye. you.